I'm Billy Crawl, pastor of Sovereign Grace Deaf Fellowship. And this is actually, I wanted to show you the sign we use for fellowship as opposed to the standard one because fellowship has to do with our unity that we have together in Christ. I'm from Colorado in Denver. My theme this morning is the Bible is reliable or trustworthy. The Bible is reliable because it is inspired. And because it is inerrant and infallible. Second Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen says, All scripture <clears throat> is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. The Greek word interpreted as inspired in this verse is theonustos. Scripture is God breathed. This word, translated God breathed or inspired, is a very strong word. B.B. Warfield, the great Princeton theologian, who was a great man of God, wrote a great explanation of this. He says, that which is God breathed has ultimate authority. And it has ultimate authority because there can be no higher authority than God's very word. The word inspired, as we said, comes from a Greek word meaning God breathed. This Greek form is passive. Now, a little English lesson here is the difference between active and passive. Let's say I say, I push. I push is something that I do that's active. If I say, on the other hand, I was pushed, it is not me who does the acting, but I am acted upon. Someone else pushes me, therefore I was pushed. That is passive form. So if this were an active verb, then we would actually see the Bible being alive and breathing. But that's not the case. 
Rather, it means that God breathes upon the scripture. God is the actor in this. And the writers of the scriptures are the ones who are acted upon. They are breathed upon and therefore write what God has given them. Okay, we're clear here that this is passive. Let's look at some of the views of how this inspiration takes place. What then is the relationship between God and the authors? How is it that God acts upon them? Does God actually do the writing? Or in our case, it would be as if we were to type. That would be the mechanical view. In that way, man, the actual writer, is not involved creatively at all. They don't come up with their own ideas, but rather God uses them as if they were a typewriter, so to speak, and comes out with a result. The writers would then read that and actually be somewhat surprised because they were not their own ideas. They were just used as machines by God. I remember uh, learning vocabulary as a child, and it, and it was very difficult. Well, there are others who have learned unbelievable amounts of vocabulary. That a mechanical view would allow for someone like me to create all of this great vocabulary that I'd never actually learned because God just used me as the machine, so to speak. The second view is a dynamical view. That God inspired the writers, not necessarily inspired the writings, but he inspired the writers as persons. That they were inspired in all of their lives. And so anything that they would write would be the word of God. And that's an incorrect view. It's not that they were inspired people and anything they wrote then was the Word of God. The correct view is an organic view. And with your Organic view, God uses our educational experience. God uses our personalities, our creativity, etc. And he superintends that so that we write what he wants us to say. So, God used the writers and all of their personality to write the word of God. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say that I plan to go to the store. God puts a, a thought in my mind to go to the store. Now I sit down trying to write, how am I going to write this? I am going to the store. Am I going to say I am walking to the store? See, I might change that to I am walking or I am going to ride my bicycle to the store. But all of the writing that I do, all of the thoughts that I come up with, are superintended by God. 
God is in control over what the final product is, but he does not uh, do that apart from the writer's thought processes, uh, style, experience, etc. And he superintends them in such a way that even the words are the correct words used. And we'll get into that uh, verbal inspiration a little bit later. So again, looking at the relationship of the authors to the scripture, is this an, that God inspires um, their thought or what? Okay. What is, how is it that God works in the writer and then the writer produces these words? Thought inspiration means that God only inspired the thought. From that point on, it was up to the writer. They used their own vocabulary. They used their own style. And so those who had uh, had a higher education would have used uh, more fancy language. And those who did not have as good uh, language skills did not write as well. All that was inspired was the thoughts, but not the actual writing. And that's an incorrect view. Partial inspiration is a view that only portions of the Bible are inspired by God, and that also is incorrect. The correct view is a verbal plenary, plenary inspiration. Verbal, meaning that the actual words are inspired. Because there's no way to separate thoughts from words. The Holy Spirit guided both in the thoughts and in the words themselves. So that those words were words that communicated what God wanted to communicate. So it was verbally inspired. Plenary inspiration means that it is fully or entirely inspired. Not just portions of the Bible, but the entire Bible is inspired by God. And that means that the entire Bible is infallible because it is all the Word of God. And there are no errors because God makes no errors. Second Timothy 3.16 says again that all scripture is God breathe. What does that mean in this case, all scripture? Is he only referring to the Old Testament? Or the New Testament as well? There are those who believe that, that because the New Testament had not been completed, that it was only referring to the Old Testament. 
and others who believe that Paul was referring to both. First Timothy 5.18 says, For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, which is a reference from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4, which is the Old Testament. And the laborer is worthy of his wages. Which comes from Luke chapter 10, verse 7. So, do you see that he refers to the scriptures and then refers both to the Old and New Testament? Therefore, the scriptures or all scriptures would include both the Old and New Testament. Paul joins the Old Testament and New Testament together as Scripture. So we've looked at inspiration. What about infallibility? It doesn't mean that it can't fall, but rather that it can't fail. That would mean that there are no errors. And so it's important that we understand infallibility and inerrancy. Looking at the Webster Dictionary, infallible is defined of incapable of error, secondly, not liable to mislead or deceive or disappoint. And thirdly, incapable of error in defining doctrines. That's a dictionary view of the word infallible. So I wanted you to get a general idea of the meaning of that word, but let's look at it more specifically in regard to the Bible. Infallible has to do with a reliability. A person says what they say is always true. There are not exceptions, but they do, what they say is always true. And so we can depend on it. Inerrancy, you can see contained within this word E-R-R, -R, err. So inerrancy meaning that there are no errors.
What that means is that all of the writings of Scripture are truth, totally free of error, and without mistakes. And so we can know that what they wrote was true and without error. And because it's truthful, it is trustworthy. Everything that they wrote is trustworthy because it is inerrant. Some people believe that the Bible is inerrant in issues of morality and spirituality, but not in terms of science or history or geography. There are a lot of Christians like that who believe the Word of God, except in areas of science. However, the inerrancy of Scripture applies to all aspects of Scripture, including the historical and the scientific. What God said is truth. There is no error. 2 Timothy 3.16 supports this belief, saying all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The incorrect view would be uh, that of limited inerrancy. Okay, do we know how old the earth is? Uh, five or six thousand years old, uh, following the Hebrew calendar. Uh, there are people who look at science and say that it's impossible for it to be that old, and so they reject what Scripture has to say and uh, uh, because they believe what science teaches in saying that the earth is much older than that. So they would believe that the Bible is inerrant in moral matters, spiritual matters, and religious truth. But when it comes to uh, cosmology, God's uh, making of the earth, the, how the earth came about, origin of life, and other scientific matters, they believe that it's not accurate. For example, they look in the Bible and see the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they say that there is no scientific evidence for there being a place called Sodom, and so they don't accept that as true. I want you to be clear that our translations today into various languages, like the King James Version, we have to be very careful about those translations. There are people who will only accept the King James Version. But we have to understand that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and in those original Hebrew writings, from the pen of the author, they were inerrant. Then those were copied and translated. But our, when we say that they are inerrant, we say that they are inerrant in their original autographs. And we say the same for the New Testament, which was written in Greek. 
Now, there are copyist errors. What if you had a copyist who just didn't have his morning coffee that day? There are mistakes that are made in the copying of scripture. What we're talking about is inerrancy in the original autograph. And inerrancy is fundamental to the doctrine of biblical authority. Because if there are errors in scripture, how can it tell us what to do? And Kevin's going to be speaking more about the scripture as our final authority. So we won't go into more depth on that. It is so important that we that the Bible is inerrant because it tells us the way of salvation. Can you imagine if there are errors in that? Maybe there are errors then in its explanation of salvation. So we can't trust it. We have to be able to believe that it's true. Another key area is that it's the Holy Spirit who superintended the process of the scriptures being written. So we know that God makes no errors. So if scripture has an error, then clearly that comes from the Holy Spirit coming from God as the creator of those errors, or the author of those errors. There are churches out there who do not accept all of Scripture, who actually preach from the pulpits parts of the Bible that they do not believe are true. And they, in essence, are accusing God of error. The Bible claims to be inerrant. Jesus gave a stamp of approval to the Old Testament, even down to the jot and tittle. Let's look at that. He says, for assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law or from the word of God till all is fulfilled. Note the term jot and tittle. Now, think about the Hebrew uh, alphabet. We start with A and end with Z. Let's imagine the Hebrew alphabet. Let's look at the smallest letter. The smallest letter in, in English, if you put them all side by side, would be the I. So that would be referred to as the jot. The tittle would be the types of... Uh, extra marks upon a letter. Have you ever seen Spanish? On Spanish there is a, a tilde over the E. Or an accent mark of some type. And those types of markings have different meanings and they are very small. They're small but they have great meaning. If you were not to have those there would be great confusion. It's like the dotted I in English. 
that is a tittle. So not even the jot or tittle will pass away until all the law is fulfilled. Hebrews 1 tells us how God has spoken. He has spoken at various times and in various ways in the past to the fathers, by the prophets. Now it's saying in these last days, we're going to be looking at how God speaks. Okay? Think about that. In the Old Testament, for example, God spoke directly to Adam. And God spoke directly to Eve. And that kind of revelation took place up until about 60 or 70 A.D., which was the completion of Scripture. And after that, there was no more direct special revelation, as Yari explained. Okay, but this explains to us how God spoke in those last days, that he spoke through his son. So who set down the words of the Bible? They were written by human beings. God did not physically write the scriptures, but rather human beings were used by God to write the scriptures that they were conveyed by human authors. In a, in a factory, you often see what's called a conveyor belt, and things move along that conveyor belt from one part to another. And in the same way, God conveyed the scripture through human beings. Now first, before we look closely at this verse, prophecy in Scripture does not always refer to prediction of the future. But it has to do with the speaking of God's word. It says, prophecy never came by the will of man. Okay? It wasn't man who initiated the um, writing of Scripture. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at that more clearly. Yeah. Holy men, meaning God has set apart individuals for the task, or God did set apart individuals for the task of writing the scriptures. And those people who were set apart, those holy men, were inspired or moved by the Holy Spirit. See, God, it's not that the, again, that the men are uh, somehow better than others, but God has set them apart and then the Holy Spirit moves them to write. Again, prophecy is never, does not come by the will of man. The interpreter just said that it was the uh, men who were inspired. It was meant to say that the, that the writing 
or the words themselves were inspired. See, it's an interesting thing. No one was there to see God create the world because before that sixth day, there was not even a man on earth. So how is it that humans were able to record the creation of the world? Obviously, they couldn't do it as eyewitnesses. There had to be God giving this information to men somehow for them to write it because they were not witnesses. So that work of the Holy Spirit is vital. Moses wrote about the creation of the world. And Moses was not there and so didn't know about it. God revealed this to Moses and Moses then wrote it. Last night, Yari spoke on Revelation. Let's look at the connection between relation, Revelation and inspiration. It, creation by God is a fact, but it's not a fact that, God, that any man could know. Only God knew that fact, so therefore God had to Reveal that to individuals. That is revelation. God revealing facts to people. Inspiration has to do with keeping those facts as facts and not with error. So God reveals those facts and those facts are then written on paper and not changed and not added to in any way. Does the Bible believe or state, excuse me, does the Bible state that it has error? There were many who accused Jesus of arrogance for believing that he was the son of God and Jesus was answering their, to their uh, accusations. He says, is it not written in your law? And this was speaking uh, during the time of the judges. He says, is it not written in the law if he called them gods to whom the word of God came? You see, he referred to that as the word of God. And the scriptures cannot be broken. Jesus said the scripture cannot be broken. He was affirming that scripture was without error in even its most casual phrases. All of scripture is flawless in all of its detail. There are some people who have difficulty believing stories like Jonah and being swallowed by a big fish.
But look what Jesus affirmed, this account of Jonah. Jesus referred to it simply as a historical, historical fact. He said, first, Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights uh, in the earth. You see, he just included it as a statement of fact. And there are others who don't believe in the great flood that took place during the time of Noah, and they believe it is a fable. Again, Jesus referred to it in the same way, as a historical fact. He said, in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Jesus affirmed these biblical facts. And there are those who have trouble believing in the story of Cain and Abel. But this death of Abel is um, attested to by Christ in Luke, where he says, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. So once again, he confirms these facts as historical facts Let's look at some of the evidence for the inerrancy of Scripture. For hundreds of years, People have been attempting to find errors and contradictions within Scripture. Because they will say things like, this king supposedly became king at the age of 42, but another reference says that he's king at the age of 22. We have God speaking to David and uh, some other places saying there was the devil who spoke to David. That kind of thing. Uh, people are searching for contradictions in Scripture, and yet none have been proven. Over and over again, people bring these forward as possible contradictions, and they're proven to be wrong, and we find that the Bible is in perfect harmony. People question the historical and geographical credibility of Scripture, and yet all archaeological findings have confirmed what is in Scripture. They question the Bible's internal harmony. and the New Testament's use of the Old Testament. All of those have been found to be perfectly harmonious and accurate.
the first part of the Bible was written many thousands of years ago by Moses. And wouldn't you expect that to have been, to have disappeared by now? 5,000 or so years ago, Scripture was written. And yet it survived. And that's one of the evidences for the inerrancy of Scripture. The Bible has been the most persecuted book in all history. People have burned it. People have ridiculed it. People have attacked it in so many ways, trying to get rid of the Bible. There have been kings who have commanded that all scripture be, be taken and gotten rid of in their kingdoms. And so we see that throughout history, this attack on scripture, and yet it has survived. The Word of God says, through Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 8, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. 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 Other evidence for the inspiration of Scripture is the proof of prophecy. Many of the events in the life of Jesus were foretold in the Old Testament in very accurate detail, such as his virgin birth, the town of his birth, the flight into Egypt. Altogether, there are about 300 prophecies in the Old Testament referring specifically to Jesus, and all of them came true or were fulfilled. Again, 300 specific prophecies about Jesus. And this is an amazing fact here. Imagine if these were not inspired by God and just the predictions of man. If we were to make 300 predictions about somebody... If eight of those 300 were to come true, that would be an amazing thing. But these were predictions about his birth, predictions about how he grew up, and they would expect... Um, that the odds of eight of those prophecies being fulfilled are one in 100 trillion. Now we can't imagine 100 trillion. That's millions upon millions upon millions. Imagine filling the state of Texas. with marbles or with silver stones. And imagine that being filled with those small 
marbles two feet high over the entire state of Texas. And now we're going to put an X on one of those and mix it into those three, 100 trillion, the two feet filling all of Texas. And then somebody comes in blindfolded and picks out that one stone on the first try. Can you imagine how, how that would be? That is the odds of one in 100 trillion. I think that seems impossible, doesn't it? That they would draw the one with the X on it on their first try. So, if only eight prophecies were to come true, the odds of eight prophecies coming through true or being fulfilled is one in one trillion. Excuse me, one in one hundred trillion. The odds of all 300 of them coming true is overwhelming and mind-blowing. Also, we have the testimony of Jesus as evidence of inerrancy. Jesus often referred to the Old Testament. And he will say, haven't you read in Scripture? And then he will quote from the Old Testament. But I would like to look at Matthew 22 to see what he said here. He didn't say, did you just listen to Scripture? He says, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? Now, we can often say that Isaiah said and Jonas said, but in this particular instance, he doesn't say that Moses said this. He says, have you not written what, read what God has said, not what Moses has said? So the writings of Moses were spoken by God. And he never contradicted anything in the Old Testament. The 12 disciples were concerned when Jesus was ready to leave them. But and they couldn't remember all of what Jesus said. And so they would sit down and try to think about what he said on one particular um, trip or he would quote from scripture and they couldn't remember which passages it was because they're human beings. Jesus said, I will send you the Holy Spirit who will help you remember the things that I've said to you. Without the Holy Spirit, we couldn't remember it all. We can't trust human memory and human knowledge.
Now, we, we, we mentioned that every part of Scripture is important and inerrant. That every jot and every tittle is inspired and inerrant. That means that every part of Scripture is the Word of God. And I would like to tell a story that will illustrate why this is so important. There was a large company in um, New York that would pay for goods with promissory notes. And a promissory note is basically an IOU. It's a promise to pay. And uh, this person who wrote the promissory notes said that if you needed any reference regarding their credit, they could check with that large company in New York. And so they checked with the company. And the company sent a telegram saying, says, note is good for any amount. And so they accepted the credit and turned the goods over to the person because of that telegram saying that their note was good for any amount. And yet that person didn't pay. So they looked into the situation, contacted the original company in Chicago that had said that the note was good, and there was one mistake on that telegram. It should have said, not good for any amount. And because of the addition of the E, it said note good for any amount. Can you see the great difference just from one letter? And that E caused them to lose all of this money. What that illustrates for us is the importance of each letter in scripture, even the jot and tittle are his word. And finally, we can trust the word of God. In 1863, the Archbishop of the Church of England sent a bishop to uh, the Zulu people in South America. He said South America. In Africa, excuse me, the Zulu people in Africa. And this person had been critical of the first books five books of the Bible, saying that they weren't written by Moses. And this is the response of the Archbishop. He said that all of our hopes for eternity, the very foundation of our faith, our nearest and dearest consolations, are taken from us if, if one line of that sacred book be declared in error.
unfaithful or untrustworthy. You see that if the Bible is not true, we have no hope. So let me ask you in closing. What is your attitude towards the word of God? Is it a casual, uncaring view? Or do you honor and trust the scripture? I would like you to think about that. Do you have an attitude like this Archbishop who believed that the only hope that they had was in an inerrant scripture, that eternal life was bound up in the truthfulness of scripture? Or do you have a more casual trust in the scripture? My prayer is that all of you will see and know that all of the Bible is the very word of God, dependable and trustworthy. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father, you are sovereign over all things, including all of Scripture. That would mean that the Bible is verbally inspired that every word, every letter, every jot, and every tittle is your word because you have guided it. You are sovereign. And so we honor your word. We know it is reliable and trustworthy. Pray, Father, that you would work in all of our hearts. That we would understand more of your word and love your word. In Jesus' name, amen.